2 Peter chapter 3, we will be looking at verses 8 through 10. 8 through 10 this morning. Have you ever heard the phrase, it's not the end of the world? You ever hear that phrase? It's a phrase of comfort, right? You know, the, your daughter comes in and says, my nail, it broke. You know, like, come on, it's not the end of the world. You know, my car toy, you know, I can't find it. Look, it's not the end of the world here. Your husband comes in, someone scratched my car. You know, come on, it's not the end of the world. So it's a phrase that we use to comfort one another, right? Now, you don't want to use that phrase when there's something that has taken place seriously in someone's life, like a death or something like that. You know, you don't go and say, wait, it's not the end of the world. That's not the time to use that phrase. And they just kind of experienced something that was very drastic. They just lost a child. And then we come in there and try to be very comforting by saying, hey, it's not the end of the world. Well, to them, it sure feels like the end of the world when they lose someone that they love. So it is a phrase of comfort, but it's not a phrase that we should use at, at all times. And it's not the end of the world. Literally, it's not the end of the world. We're still here, and God still has a plan for your life. He still has a reason for your existence, and and I hope to share that with you this morning. We ended last week in verse 7, where Peter shared about the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word of God, and are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, in the context of these ungodly men, these scoffers, mockers, who were ridiculing the word of God, laughing at the word of God, ha, 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 Jesus said he was coming back. He's not here yet. Where's he at? Where's his return? And they're laughing, and Peter talks about the the sure word of God, and he gave us the examples of creation. He gave us the example of the flood, and then he's telling us here that these ungodly men will be judged one day just as sure as the world was created, just as sure as the flood came. And so he ends with this, and perdition of ungodly men. Ungodly men, men who would not receive the gospel. Men who hear the word of God and refuse it. They reject it. But yet God is so gracious and loving that he hasn't taken their lives yet. The end of the world is not here yet. He's still having grace upon their lives. You might have a loved one who you've been praying for for a long time, and you've been hoping that they come to the Lord. You may have a spouse, a child, a brother, a sister, a neighbor, a friend, and you have been praying for years. Remember, it's not the end of the world yet. God is still working. I have a brother that we have been praying for for years, probably since I became a Christian. So 27 years we've been praying for him. And he's been this close many times where he has literally come and and asked for help. And I've prayed with him and I explained to him how God was working in his life and trying to get him to uh, humble himself and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And he's even professed to do so but then has fallen back into the world. And we continue to pray for him. My mom has, has, in a sense, almost lost hope. She said, there's no more hope. I mean, he's lost completely. And I says, Mom, as long as he's still breathing, there is hope for him. And we can't lose that hope. So we need to hope in God and trust that he has a purpose through this all because the Lord is patient. And that's my theme this morning, that the Lord is patient. God is patient. He's a patient God. He's patient with all of us. And he's patiently waiting for us to make a response to him. So let's go ahead and read verses 8 through 10. Join me. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Some interesting scriptures there. You've heard them before. Uh, You've heard the scriptures about one day is as a thousand, the one day of the Lord is, is, is a thousand years for us. What does all of this mean? It's really a message of encouragement today, especially as we see what's going on in the world today. Uh, we have pestilence. 
that seems to be Ebola in, in Texas, and now they're talking about it possibly being airborne. If that's the case, then we're going to see more cases, not just in Texas, but throughout the United States. And many other diseases, STDs and, and so forth, that, that are out there. And then the weather pattern and how it's all messed up. Here we are in, in October, and it's still sunny and hot when it should be a little cooler than, than what it is. But these are just birth pains, and we see these birth pains taking place. And so this is a timely message for us to remember. The end's not yet. We're still here. And the Lord has a work. He's being patient. Let's look at verse 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as in one day. Now Peter encourages us not to forget this one thing. He wants his re readers to remember that God is in control and he is always on time. That is the God that we serve. He may not be on our time, but he is on his time. And he is in total control of everything. He hasn't lost control. He's still in control. He still sits on the throne. He still sees what, what's going on in the world today. And to us, it might seem that he's lost control because the world is out of control. Because the world has, has left the moral values that we started with, but yet God is still in control of the world, and God is still in control of our lives. I find it interesting that uh, when somebody is going through something, they immediately become hysterical. What am I going to do? How am I going to take care of this? This is too much for me. I can't take it. I recently had someone say those things, and I basically said, look, if God created the heavens and the earth, don't you think you can handle your little problem? To them, it's a big problem. And I said, God will take care of it. He promises. He promises that to all of us. And within a week or so, they write back, God is so good. He just took care of this situation, blah, blah, blah. He always does. And I've seen it over and over again. I have an interesting perspective because I get to see it, not just in my own life, but in the lives of those that come to this church. You know, the stories that I hear. And so I like hear it, a hundred times over than my, than, than my own little story. And you don't see those things because you're dealing with your own life and you're not necessarily involved in other people's lives, which you are to a certain distinct. But I hear it over and over again. People start off, how am I going to handle this? What's going to happen? This is too much. This is, this is the end, you know? And then I just hang on. Tomorrow's a new day. Watch what God does. And he is always faithful and he's always on time. I know it seems like God is, is not speaking to you. Be assured that God is working something out in your life. See, scoffers will attempt to make us believe that God has fallen asleep or that he doesn't keep his promises. That's the ploy of the enemy. God isn't working. God's asleep. He doesn't care. But in reality, he does care. Don't believe those lies. Believe in the truth that God does care for you. So Peter calls for focus on this certain attention, focus our attention on this certain thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So he describes the eternal state of our God, that our God is eternal is what he's basically saying here. Now, as a Christian, you really want to know that God is eternal. That's important to us, isn't it? that he is eternal, that he is not a created being, that someone else higher than him created him or somewhere along the line he became. No, he has always been. That's important because that tells us that our God is big. Our God is huge. Our God can handle the little issues in our life. And so it's important that we understand that our God is eternal. The question is, Peter is making a literal statement or is he making a similitude here? Is, is he being literal that a thousand years of our life is one day to the Lord? Is he being literal there or is he giving us an analogy in a sense? Well, we know that he quotes from Psalms 90 verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes and like a watch in the night. And so he's quoting from an Old Testament psalm that David wrote there, again, so, uh, validating the Old Testament writings for us. The Reformation Study Bible says that this passage has been misunderstood and misapplied quite often. 
This is what it says. Through this passage and Psalms 90 verse 4 upon which is based is sometimes cited to support the theory that when a day is mentioned in biblical prophecy, a literal thousand years is meant. Peter's point is to assert that God is sovereign over time and that his perspective on time differs radically from us. Is that the point that Peter is making? That God is eternal? That time really is not an issue for him. He doesn't deal and work within our time frame. If he is eternal and the heavens are eternal, then there is no time in heaven. The only time that we have is here upon this earth. And so God doesn't view time as we view time. Now, if it's literal, then a thousand years of our life is just like one day to the Lord. And again, it's nothing. When you calculate it out, if you live to be 65 years, The Lord has only dealt with like an hour and a half of time. That's not a lot of time for the Lord to deal with. And so he's not slack. He's not slow. 65 years of our life goes by and it's only been an hour for him. (laughs) And so he's going, what's their problem? Why are they so worried? You know, that kind of brings up a question in my own mind. Well, if if time is irrelevant in, in the heavens, in God's life, then does he really care for us? Well, yes, of course he does. Because if time is irrelevant and God is eternal, then he sees the eternal picture, doesn't he? We only see the present. Uh, We see the past, but we don't see the future. We can see what happened yesterday. We can see what's happening right now, but you can't see what's happening next. You don't know what I'm about to say next. Because we're bound by time. God isn't. He sees the past, what you've gone through. He sees your present, and he sees what you will go through. And so God knows what the future holds for your life. And if God holds your future in his hands, then you know that he has something good for you. And if you're his child, then you know for sure that it's something great. And so you can trust in him and in his promises. That's something we forget. And it's so simple. But when we go through things, we think, God, you let us go. Somehow we jumped off your hand. Well, God's got a big enough hand that he holds the whole world in his hand, the Bible says. You can't jump off his hand. You might go from one finger to the next, but that's about it. You're still there. You're still there. See, God is huge. He cares about us because he sees the eternal. Someone said Peter moves from the timelessness of God to the tenderness of God. He changes directions here in verse 9. He talks about God's timelessness, how awesome it is to be eternal. To know all things, beginning and end. And to be able to construct within all of that his plan and his will for each one of our lives. Pretty amazing. And then he comes and he shares with us the tenderness of God. We serve a tender God, a loving God, a compassionate God. And he says in verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, Peter does not dispute the mocker's claim that the second coming has been delayed. Obviously, he hasn't come yet. But there's a purpose for him not coming. There's a reason behind it. He uses the delay as an opportunity to explain that another reason of the Lord's return seems to be so long in coming is that God wants many people to be saved as possible. And so that is why he is not coming at this moment. And that makes sense to me because God loves you enough to wait upon you. The Bible talks about the age of the Gentiles. There's an age of the Gentiles. There, there's, a, there's a time frame by which God is working within this group of people. Uh, we see in the Old Testament that God created the, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, and he worked in their lives all the way to the point of Jesus. Jesus went to heaven, and then he started to expand his kingdom through the disciples. And then from the disciples, the Apostle Paul, he went to the Gentiles, and then he started the work with the Gentiles. That means non-Jewish people. We're in the age of the Gentiles, and there is one Gentile that when that person accepts Jesus Christ, then the end will be coming. It's that one person, and Jesus is waiting for that one individual to make that choice, and then all of this will begin to be over. God is not slack concerning his promises. 
He keeps his promises, but he loves us enough to wait to fulfill his promises because he loves the lost. Do we have a heart for the lost? Because God does. When was the last time you looked at someone through a different lens? When was the last time you thought of somebody as lost and going to hell? We don't like to think of those things. We kind of take them out of our mind because it's not a pleasant thought. But when was the last time you viewed your spouse, your child, your brother, your sister, or a neighbor as being lost and going to hell? Because God sees that every single day. That's their future. That's their destiny. Unless we can share with them the truth. We can plant a seed and we water that seed. We can invite them to church. We can invite them out to events. When was the last time you looked at somebody walking down the street and just wondered, I wonder if they're saved. I wonder if they know Jesus. I wonder what they're thinking right now. I wonder if they're so involved in life they don't see what's going on around them. I was watching one of those cop movies uh, shows the other day. You know, those bad boys, bad boys, you know, type of shows. And, and so this one guy was driving a vehicle that he had stolen, and he was all tatted up. And he's driving down the road, and the police are chasing him. And he came to a, a red light where there were cars are around him now, and he tried to squeeze in the center of them to get out of the way. And he literally went up the side of one vehicle, just twisted his, his stolen car's wheel completely around, and he couldn't go anywhere, and he was stopped. And, of course, all the police officers uh, came out. And um, by gun, you know, and so forth, get out of the car, show us your hands, walk backwards, lay on the ground, the whole thing. And then they put him in the car. And then the guy asked him a question, do you know what you were doing? And the guy was just wasted, you could tell. And he's like, yeah, I, I, I know I messed up. I know I messed up. And I was just listening to his answers. And in my mind, I'm thinking, what was this guy's life like? Where did he grow up? What were his parents like? Who were his friends? Uh, I'm sure he had a tough time that he made some bad choices and he got into this situation. How sad. And then I started thinking, I I hope that when he's in prison, uh, somebody comes along and shares with him Jesus. And I'm sure there will be because the prisons are filled with chaplains and people that go in there and, and share the gospel. But you ask yourself, at what point were, were he turned bad? You know? And it's sad. Do you view people that way? Your neighbors and friends? Jesus is always looking at people for an opportunity to draw them close to himself. We need to see them as lost. Let's look at this verse a little closely. Verse 9. The Lord is not slack. He's not delaying. He, he's not delaying concerning his promises as some count slackness. There's a purpose and a reason behind it. Uh, That word count means to consider and give careful thought. There's a reason behind him not allowing the end to be now. A personal reason for him not allowing the end to be here. So Peter here assures us that God keeps his promises. And the reader needs to understand why God has delayed for what seems to be a long time. So he says, but, at, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The word willing there, or not willing, is an interesting word. It speaks of God's disposition. Not just his will, but his heart. It's a willingness. It, it, it's not that he purposely, his, his purposely is being patient and long-suffering, It's that his heart is for the lost person and so he's waiting for that individual because he sees their lost soul and their destiny and he's hoping with all of his heart, with all of his character and nature that they would come to know him and not perish but that they would literally repent. They would change their minds and begin to uh, serve him. Here's an illustration because God is patient and we're not, are we? Man is impatient. How many of us would love the Lord to come back right now? I know I would. You know, I would love the Lord to come back right now. Especially as we get older, we're like, okay, we're at the end of our life. You know, let, let's come back now, Lord. And the younger ones are like, no, no, not yet. I still have a life to live. Here's an illustration. Irving Stone's classic history 
of the American West. This is a true story. During the gold rush, San Francisco had a rash of crimes. It got to the point where police were more corrupt than the criminals. So in 1851, a group of citizens formed a vigilance committee. It was not just a lynch mob. They elected Sam Brennan as president, drew up a constitution, and set up preliminary rules. Only responsible citizens are allowed to join, and, only, and they only act in emergencies when the law was not in effect. So you can picture this group of people that realize the police is totally corrupt. And so we need to do something to have law and order here. The first official act was, uh, of the group was to arrest John Jenkins, who had stolen a safe and dropped it into a boat. Tried in Brandon's office before the committee jury, Jenkins was clearly found guilty. In 1851... An 1851 law said that grand larceny was punishable by death. But most of the committee seemed reluctant to hang someone for only stealing a safe. At this point, William Howard threw his cap disgustingly on the table and cried out, Gentlemen, as I understand it, we came here to hang somebody. So that's exactly what they did. They hung him. Can you imagine God being like that? God is nothing like that. He is patient and long-suffering that he wished that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance. God is patient. Man isn't patient. We want to judge people right away. We want them taken out immediately. Whatever it takes, you know, they're wicked. Kick them out. They're not doing their job. Kick them out. They're not Christians. Get them out of here. You know, that's the way we are. God isn't like that. He's a patient God because he has a loving heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God's a God of love. You know, I'm so amazed by the transformation of individuals. And as I look around even in this church here today, it blows me away how God has taken hold of some of your lives. Can you imagine if God didn't wait? He wouldn't be here today. And if the Bible's true, you'd be separated from God on Judgment Day. You'd be sent to hell to burn for eternity. But I see how God's taken a hold of your life and how he's starting to change you and make you and mold you into a different person. And that is so exciting. I love seeing those things. I love seeing people excited for the Lord, especially new believers. There's just something about new believers that are just so exciting. It's the older believers as we get more comfortable where we just come in like, yeah, okay, whatever. But the new believer, boy, they're excited for the Lord. What do you want me to do? I'll do it, you know. And the old believer, ah, I live in grace. I'll do it next week. It's exciting to see because God is not willing that any should perish but that all will come to repentance. God's heart is clearly revealed by the prophet Ezekiel who, who quoted Jehovah in Ezekiel thirty three eleven. As I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Ezekiel thirty three thirty two. God says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. God's heart is not to judge men or to see men die, but that they repent and live. We should repent. Repent means to change uh, one's heart completely, interests, different direction. We're to turn the other way and begin to serve the Lord. A Sunday school teacher asked the class what, was the, what, what the word repent means. And a little boy uh, stood up and he said, it means to be sorry for your sins. And then a little girl raised her hand and said, it means to be sorry for your sins enough to quit. Enough to quit your sins. That's repentance. You're sorry for your sins and you're willing to quit sinning. Another little schoolgirl who was saved, um, saved and someone asked her, uh, what were you before? And she said, a sinner. And so they asked her again, well, what, were, what are you now? And she said, a sinner. And they asked, well, what's the difference? And she said, I was a sinner running after sin before, but now I'm a sinner running from sin. That's repentance, running away from sin, taking whatever steps that you need to take to not sin anymore, to change. You know, it's sad when we see people and 
there are some flaws and inconsistencies to their Christianity. And then we make the comment, they'll never change. They'll never change. That is so untrue. God has power to change us. I am still changing. It will never stop in my life. But we have to have the willingness to change. We have to make the choice that we want to change for God's glory. That's repentance. And it doesn't stop because we're a believer now. And if we're walking and living our lives and doing things that we know are wrong, then we need to make a choice to change those things. No longer going after sin, but changing. And it doesn't matter how old you are. We need to change and be willing to change. They have that phrase, you, you can't teach an old dog a new trick. Well, in Christ you can Because we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Well, I've been doing this for a long time. Well, it's time to stop. It's time to grow up. It's time to be mature. There was one time where you were a child and you thought like a child and you spoke like a child, but now it's time to be a man and get rid of those childish things. That's what the Bible says. We need to grow up. We can change. You know, here in... In this community, what we see is a lot of Hispanics who have been brought up in a certain culture. And we've seen them come into church. And it's not something that we expect uh, for them to do immediately, or I expect for them to do, or even ever. But when God gets a hold of your heart, it happens. You begin to change your lifestyle. See, I grew up in in La Puente, Roland Heights area. And I grew up with uh, people that were what we considered to be called cholos, Mexicans. Some of them were in gangs. Uh, One actually ran uh, the uh, Walnut uh, uh, group there, um, gangs. Walnut, uh, what is it called? Walnut East Side. He ran in. So I ran around with these guys. We were the the khakis. We were the hush puppies. We were the stretchy belts with our initials on it. You know what I'm talking about, some of you, maybe. You know, we, that's how we grew up. Virginia grew up that way. She had the frizzy hair, the stretchy belt with her little V on it. You know, she wore the, the corduroys. I mean, they don't even think they have corduroys anymore. I think I just saw corduroys come out uh, again. But they, she had corduroys, and they were creased and cuffed at the bottom with starch. Remember the starch, the blue starch? You spray it on, you iron it, the whole thing. We did all that. We did all that. And that's how we grew up. And that's how we started to live our lives afterwards. And then we get saved. And it was time to grow up and change. So I got rid of my khakis. I got rid of my winos. I got rid of my stretchy belt. I wear now just a normal leather belt. I pull my pants up all the way. You know, things change because you grow up. You're not set into a culture. I know that I might be offending some of you. And I hope that you're getting what I'm saying. It's time to grow up. It's time to change your life. Now, amen, sister. At least she raised her hand. Thank you. And so... Virginia's family helped me with this because my wife is, is Caucasian. She's white. And so they, didn't, they grew up in a totally different culture. Education, you know, being responsible, don't litter. I used to like throw stuff out my window. Who cares? You know, just things like that. Don't litter. They, they were responsible white Americans. You know, this is our country, you know. And, and so this is how we act. And I learned a lot from them that, that I stopped littering. I stopped doing certain things. I started thinking education reading and all of those things, I changed. I didn't stick with what I learned when I was young. And that's what God expects of us, to change. And we can't use the excuse, that's my culture. It's where I came from. No, you need to grow up. You need to change. Now, I'm not saying that you have to all start wearing polo shirts and, you know, and wearing the wing tip shoes, you know, and, and so forth. I'm not saying that. Just be normal, you know. Don't be one extreme or the other extreme. So now Peter changes uh, to his next point, the day of the Lord, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will mount with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will burn up. This phrase, the day of the Lord, we see it in the Old Testament quite often. It's the day of the Lord's anger, the day of his wrath, or just the day. 
As we look at verse 10 here a little more closely, this day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, exactly what Jesus told Peter and the disciples back in Matthew 24, 36. So Peter is just repeating what Jesus told him, that no one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels of heaven, not even my father, because it comes as a thief in the night. Now, what day is Peter talking about? Well, he's not talking about the rapture. He's not talking about the tribulation period. He's talking about the day of judgment when Christ comes back to judge the sins of the world and finally deal with sin completely. And also which the heavens will pass away with great noise. This is the big bang that will take place in this world where God will literally destroy the whole heavens will pass away, he says. It's interesting that Peter here unfolds the specific events connected with the aspect of this day of the Lord, beginning with the heavens. What does it mean by heavens? Well, he's talking about the visible universe, the vaulted expansions, the skies, and all the things that are in it, everything that is above. The Hebrews didn't really have a, a word or a concept for universe, so they just said heavens. And so when Peter says heavens, he's talking about the universe completely. And so he's indicating the whole universe will pass away at that time and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Interesting word there, heat, intense heat, burning heat, fever. Uh, Greek physicians used to describe the burning heat of fever. And here this describes how the destruction of the universe will occur. It will be with intense, furious heat beyond anything we can imagine, all going up in flames one day in the future. Just can't even imagine. Hotter than the sun as God judges it. Now, I found it interesting that Peter uses the word elements there. Here's a fisherman, an uneducated person, never been to any schools, and he uses the word elements. This is a, a defense for the scriptures that God had written them. Because you have someone that's uneducated, and, and you always hear this, well, we can't really go back to the biblical times and really depend upon some of the teachings there because these were uneducated people. We're more educated today. We're more intelligent. Look at what's going on in society today. So we need to depend more on our scientists. We need to depend more on our educated system. You know, those guys, I mean, they didn't even have cars. Come on. Let's realize they're not educated people, but yet here Peter uses the word elements. A fisherman using a word like this, an uneducated individual taking an intelligent scientific word and using it within the destruction of the world. The word element literally means ones in a row, as in a letter of alphabets. Peter uses this word to say everything is aligned perfectly in the universe. Everything is held together A, B, C, D by God's hand. God has perfectly designed all the elements of the world to be held by matter itself, the atoms and the neutrons and the protons and all of those things. His idea is that everything is standing in a row and thus referring to an orderly arrangement by someone else. As applied to material things, it means the element substance that constitute matter, the basic elements that make up chemical uh, composures of the universe, the components into which matter is ultimately divisible and ultimately includes the very elements that make up the universe, such as the atoms. Peter, through the Holy Spirit, uses this word to describe the matter of the whole universe. Not bad for an unintelligent person to understand those things. Well, how could Peter even understand how the earth? And you know what? It wasn't until recently that we even began to understand what Peter is describing here. And so these guys were educated through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that say to us? That says to us that God uses his uneducated people, that he likes to use people that don't have the master's degrees, that don't have their PhDs, and then they go out and they do great things for the Lord. And who gets the glory? God gets the glory. God gets the glory. Because we ask ourselves, how does that guy know? Where did he get his education? Now, nothing against education because some of the greatest uh, Christian pillars of today were very educated people. Very educated people. Um, 
who give us some of the greatest insights to scriptures completely. But when you get someone uneducated, you know God's doing a work. And it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And so in addition to the fervent heat, both the earth and the works, and the works means the labor and the toil that are in it will burn up. So now he uses the word burn up, a little different word than the word fervent heat there. Burn up means to literally burn up, to consume, to destroy by violent heat. So Peter paints this, this masterpiece picture of the final act of God to purge the universe uh, of sin and sinners. And of course, this will take place after the great tribulation period, after he destroys the ungodly, after the Antichrist has been sent to the pit of hell. Let me close. Peter begins to say, look, scoffers and mockers, God is not slack concerning his promises. He loves people and he wants to see them come to know him. And so he's waiting. He's waiting. But it is coming and when it comes, it will judge you. It will judge the ungodly and it will destroy the universe, the earth, and the work in it. It will cut utterly be consumed by the judgment of God, that God once and for all will deal with sin and separate the ungodly from the godly. God is faithful to keep his promises, and his promises to you, that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. If you confess him as Lord and Savior, he says he will save you. Those are promises that he is looking for. Does God care about the lost? He sure does. He has a heart for the lost, and we should too. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for revealing to us, Lord, that you have promises for every one of us here today, Lord, and you will keep those promises, Lord. Promises of peace, promises of the future, promises of rest, promises of hope, Lord, and we look forward to the promises that you keep, even for this church, Lord, that you continue to build it, Father, for your glory, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. For without it, Lord, I would not be here. Many of us would not be here, Lord. But Lord, we thank you for being patient and not bringing your judgment yet, Lord. And I still pray for my grandchildren, Lord, and my great-grandchildren, Lord, who will be born, Lord, if you tarry, Lord. But Lord, when that day comes, We should know and understand that you are a just God, a righteous God. And when it comes to judge, you will judge righteously. And we will have no excuses, Lord, when we stand before you. And so let us make the choice today to have Jesus in our hearts. In his name we pray.